Thank you again for being here. And um, I want to turn things over to Commissioner Steve Banks to begin. It's great to be in Brooklyn, where I actually live. So it's not that far from home. It's also good to actually get home earlier than I usually do. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to do that. Um, I want to acknowledge a few people and, and then make a, a few remarks. First of all, I want to acknowledge Molly uh, Murphy, special counsel at HRA, who uh, worked very hard to make sure I actually got here, uh, <laughs> and also to put together so much of, of the program. Um, I also want to really um, give my appreciation to Sandra and to Wayne for all of their guidance during my time as commissioner so far. And I hope we're going to keep uh, receiving the good ideas. Community Voices Heard is a really important uh, constituent group from our perspective uh, at HRA. And Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies really has been extraordinarily helpful in terms of policy advocacy. And Ann Kim, at my old legal aid colleague, I mean, it's like legal aid lawyers are everywhere, right, in the world. It's, and uh, I appreciate, uh, Liz, that you, uh, that you thought that I might have something to say. I also want to acknowledge uh, Judge uh, Helen uh, Friedman and Henry Friedman, who are here, two people who have been warriors uh, against uh, in the war on poverty. Henry was there at the birth of so many of the important cases that have been such important principles of due process, Goldberg, and, 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 and the like. And I know we can now say, because we no longer have these roles, but Judge Friedman was absolutely instrumental in the establishment, the development, and the enforcement of the right uh, to shelter in City, and that it made immense contributions to um, addressing poverty in the city. So it's important to recognize them. I also saw that uh, Professor Pittler passed away, and uh, he made a, an extraordinarily important contribution to uh, poverty law, which people may not know about. He was the chair of the Law Revision Commission at a time when certain litigants were looking for a good faith exception to contempt. Uh, and he was actually a very strong force for saying that there should not be a good infor faith enforcement uh, for contempt. And uh, he took that position. Ultimately, the New York State Court of Appeals agreed that there should not be a good faith uh, defense to contempt. So that was a really important contribution that he made in the ability to enforce the rights of low-income people. So what could I say to an audience of law students and lawyers? Some of you work for HRA and other government agencies, and some of you uh, work in public interest organizations. Some of you would like to be employed in public interest organizations. Some of you are delighted to hear about all the funding that we're making available to public interest organizations. <laughs> I know that. Uh, but I think that the most, the most important thing to think about as lawyers in the context of the war on poverty is what a critical role lawyers actually have played in fighting poverty. Uh, it's no secret that one of the key programs was uh, the legal services uh, programs, MFY and, and the other programs that came out of the effort to address poverty, that access to justice and enforcement of legal rights uh, were seen at the very beginning of the war on poverty as an important right. Of course, uh, that attracted the attention of a lot of other forces uh, that reacted to the effectiveness of the provision of legal counsel, but legal services remains an important tool in terms of the enforcement of rights and the protection of low-income people uh, along the road to winning the war on poverty. But also for government lawyers, and I say particularly to my colleagues at HRA, uh, who were very much involved in a tremendous reform effort at the agency, that the lawyers in the government agencies have a major role to play in terms of the in ensuring that the programs are working correctly and helping design new programs. So essentially, ending poverty is a full employment program for lawyers, <laughs> which I know is terrific to make, uh, to, to make that statement in, in a law school uh, with all the issues around legal education that are out there. But in all seriousness, um, if you look at what we've been trying to do at HRA, there are a couple of things that stand out in the context of, of this. Uh, first, that 11 months ago, HRA had no legal services programs, zero. We now have uh, approximately $50 million worth of legal services programs in, uh, in our baseline budget. Um, why is that, you might ask? It's because the mayor sees HRA as an important part 
of fulfilling the goals of the administration in fighting poverty and income inequality. And as part of the tools to do that, the provision of legal services is part of that effort. So um, I know that there are some uh, who have been working with us over this period that say, you only went from zero to 50. It feels like you went from about zero to 200 miles an hour, but we went from zero to 50 in terms of the funding, and that I think is gonna make a tremendous difference in terms of uh, the access to justice for low-income people. Similarly, and many of you who are uh, public interest lawyers have been participating in the work groups that we have at HRA. I think you almost feel like we're work grouping everybody to death. It's a feeling inside the agency too, so it's okay for those of you that are participating. But you can see what a key role that the lawyers play. And Molly Murphy as a, a special counsel and uh, Martha Calhoun, who's general counsel and her staff, play a major role in enabling the reforms. Sometimes I know we think of lawyers as their naysayers. No, you can't do that, you can't do that. But the lawyers at HRA now are playing a major frontline role in helping roll out the kinds of reforms that we're, that we're involved with. And you know, what's the state that we find ourselves in when we look at the client caseload at HRA? It's really a, a, an indication of what the problem is. So when you see the fact that we've got 1.7 million people receiving food stamps, in the city, you'd say, great, we're drawing in a lot of federal benefits. And that's really a good thing. We're bringing in federal benefits, we're addressing hunger, and for every $1 of federal benefits, it generates uh, $1.80 in economic activity in the communities. So it's a good program, right? It's helping fight hunger, and it's creating local economic activity. But it also tells you if our annual caseload on cash assistance is about 500,000 uh, people, men, women, and children, in an annualized number, and about 350,000 if you look at it in any given month, as I know some people like to look at it, but you really should look on an annual basis. What does that tell you? It tells you that people in the workplace are depending on food stamps to address the inadequacy of wages. The gap between the numbers of people on cash assistance and the numbers of people receiving federal food stamp assistance is a good barometer of the state of the economy in the world in which our clients are living. Even more troubling, if you look at the numbers of people under federal and state law who are required to participate in the employment programs that HRA has historically run, and we'll talk about those in a, in a moment, out of those 350,000 people, most of them are children, so they're not participating in the work programs. Many of them are seniors, so they're exempt. Even under the prior two administrations analysis of our caseload, about another 90,000 people are just exempt for other reasons. So you're left with about 80 to 90,000 people. That's what all the focus is about, 80 to 90,000 people out of the three million people that are getting help from HRA. That's what the focus is all about. But 25,000 of that group of people 25,000 people are working full time, are working full time. And what does that tell you? That you can be working full time and the wages you're earning are still not enough to lift you out of poverty. Not even lift you out of poverty, to move you off of our caseload. So that's why in the context of a war on poverty, the mayor's focus on the minimum wage is so important because whether you look at federal food stamps, you look at cash assistance, you can see what the challenges are. Now let's talk about employment. I mean, the, the, the debate around federal welfare reform was always about we should give people employment. Isn't that the ladder out of poverty? And it is if it's a career pathway out of poverty. It's a career pathway out of poverty. And what do we mean by that? And, and frankly, Advocacy groups like Community Voices Heard and Federation Protestant Welfare Agencies have, have been right zeroed in on this problem historically in terms of uh, the, the traditional approach that HRA has taken to employment and employment programs. That the focus was on moving people off the caseload as quickly as possible and then measuring typically if they're returned to the caseload in about six months. So we looked at it slightly differently. 
we looked at how many people were returning to the caseload within 12 months. So it's one out of four people returning to the caseload at, within uh, a 12 month period of time. And we're spending $200 million on this program. Uh, if it was proposed uh, by a different side of the political spectrum, it would be a highly criticized program historically. But it became a program that was been embedded for 20 years in terms of the way HRA ran things. And they, the roots of that program, uh, the roots of that approach is what produced the WEP program, uh, which uh, essentially was intended to lead you to employment, but actually led you to, 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 to not, nothing. And so, as we recently described uh, to the city council, uh, and in our employment plan that was approved by the state on December 31st, we're taking a very different approach. Taking a very different approach, which is a way we have to get away from a one size fits all approach uh, in terms of employment. We have to look at our obligations as an agency to ensure that people have the training and education to actually have a career pathway out of poverty. We know that if you don't have a high school equivalency or high school credential of some sort, you're going to earn about $20,000. You're going to be in poverty. We know that if you do have that credential, you're going to earn about $30,000. And we know that if you spend about uh, two years in college, an associate's degree, or four years of college, you're going to earn $40,000 more or more in income. So it's extremely important that as we shape our reform efforts in HRA and our new programs, that you look at what we're doing to try to move people on those kinds of career trajectories because that's the route uh, out of poverty. Now, everyone on our caseload can't work. Some people can't work. Some people can work with limitations. And as we've announced recently in settlement of litigation, uh, and through our own reforms, we're going to be much more focused on ensuring that we assess people in terms of what their real needs are and that people who are unable to work, we're going to be very focused on moving them uh, onto federal uh, SSI benefits. Uh, and for those of you that uh, are very focused on what does that mean for lawyers, uh, we announced that we're implementing a new legal services initiative to help represent people who are denied federal benefits to move more people off of the caseload onto federal benefits. Again, looking at legal services as a tool to help move uh, in the direction that we want all, all go in. Uh, in terms of employment training, we changed our position and supported and, and, and it was enacted a new state law that enables our clients to go to four years of college uh, to move off the caseload in, in, in that way. And all this is occurring in a very different context in the de Blasio administration because in the past, HRA was not at the table in terms of discussions about uh, job creation. And the mayor appointed a Jobs for New Yorkers task force and uh, it built upon our employment efforts, our employment plan efforts, and its focus is on having our clients be very much part of the career pathways out of poverty and the job training programs. Sounds too good to be true, right? Doesn't sound like uh, the old HRA, right? <laughs> but the old HRA actually has very interesting roots. It was really created in the Lindsay administration as a super agency. And it was the city's focus on fighting poverty and income inequality. So in a lot of respects, the agency has come full circle under a mayor that is focused on fighting poverty and income inequality to embrace its mission of fighting poverty and income inequality. Some of you who are practicing know that it, we're providing a lot more rental assistance to prevent evictions than we ever used to. Some of you know that we're now running rental assistance programs and uh, obviously we're in New York City and there is the New York City Housing Authority and HPD, but compare the size of our rental assistance program that we're actually running directly at HRA for low income people to programs in other cities and you'll see that we have one of the largest rental assistance programs uh, that exist. Again, seeing that as a tool to help move people out of poverty. Now we want to wrap up with, with one note of uh, context. After 20 years, you can't make all these changes overnight. And that's frustrating to us, it's frustrating to our clients, but it's a motivation of the urgency of the kind of changes we're making because we know, realistically, that notwithstanding all of the changes we're making, phasing out WEP, four-year college, rental assistance, legal services, assessing people better, we settled 70,000 pending fair hearings over the course of the last year, settled them. Um, it's a fairly 
substantial number if you think about it. In the midst of all of that, we know that any day of the week, we're still making reforms and you could walk into one of our centers and the reforms haven't taken uh, full grip, I'll just put it that way. But last but not least, the workers of HRA are an important part of uh, fighting poverty and moving forward. And I learned at the Legal Aid Society um, how critical workload is to quality of services. And when we got a criminal defense case cap, for example, or we got a juvenile rights practice case cap, and we limited the numbers of cases that lawyers could handle at any one time in the juvenile practice and in the criminal practice, what a difference it made in terms of the comprehensive services that could be provided to clients. HRA workers are no different. For 20 years, they have been implementing transaction after transaction, notices upon notices, upon call-ins, upon case closings, upon reopenings, churning, 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 churning. And these transactions take their toll on workload. And so we've been going about the process through our reforms of addressing worker workload because that is a very important part of addressing, we think, the needs of our clients. Having said that, the context in which we operate in is different than the context in which Lyndon Johnson conceived of his war on poverty. We operate in the context of federal and state laws that require us to do certain things that were never required before of, of, uh, of, of social services agencies. And so we have participation rate obligations, we have a whole range of issues that we have to confront and deal with. But that doesn't mean that we can't confront and deal with those things in a reform approach. We've accomplished a lot in a year. We know we have a lot more to accomplish, and I appreciate everyone's interest in what we're doing. I'm sure there are terrific questions, and I know my colleagues on the panel will have interesting perspectives, but I appreciate the opportunity to let people know what we're doing. I hope you invite me back, and you can see how we're doing as we go along uh, in the future. Thank you very much.